Today's podcast is sponsored by MPB, the online pricing engine that provides the right price for any camera or lens. Get free kit pickup and get paid within days, all without leaving your home. How much could you get? Find out with a free instant quote at www.mpb.com forward slash sell. Hello and welcome to the AV Forums podcast for Monday the 12th of June 2023. Uh, confession, this is pre-recorded. We are recording on the 7th of June uh, because I will be secret squirreling away uh, somewhere in Europe uh, and be able after that to tell you all about what I'm doing. But I can't tell you at the moment because I've signed a form saying I won't tell you. Uh, but anyway, we're recording this uh, especially to go out on Monday night. It's the same length. It's the same regulars. So joining me tonight is Ed Sally, Ian Collin, Julian Scott and Martin Jew. Good evening, guys. Hello, sir. Good evening, and you will have noticed those eagle eyed watching on the video that we've got two special guests this evening. Joining us is Stacey Spears and Don Mansell from Spears and Mansell fame. Good evening, guys. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, it will all become clear very quickly why uh, we have our special guests on tonight. So what we're we'll be doing tonight, we're going to talk about the LG G3. It's sitting behind me. Well, the 55 inches sitting behind me at the moment. Uh, it's been on route for five weeks, thanks to Peter Tyson for uh, long term in this one. So we got it for at least six months. It's a retail sample. I've also looked at the 65 inch. So we're going to talk about them tonight. Obviously, micro lens array is the big thing uh, with the G3. So we'll get into a little bit of that a little bit later on. And it's also going, going to be looking at the uh, focal speakers that we had a world exclusive one. He's going to tell you all about that. And Martin's also going to be talking about speakers tonight. He's covered the clips, the sevens powered speakers. So we'll be getting into that. Our two guests tonight, Stacey and Don, uh, they'll be explaining what they do, their work, uh, and the tool that is the calibration disc that they put out, the benchmark disc. Uh, we're on to a lovely three disc edition uh, that's just been released recently. That's why they're on tonight. We're going to talk about that, but also going to talk about why these things are, are needed and why you should have one uh, for your home theatre or just setting up your TV. Uh, we also have our usual roundup of TV, home cinema and hi-fi news from Ian. And we'll also answer some of your questions, but obviously we're not live tonight. So uh, do keep the questions coming in. Uh, the best place for those uh, will probably be in the podcast forum underneath this podcast. If you go in there, ask a question in there, or you can send them via email to podcast at avforums.com and we'll answer your questions as soon as we have them and as soon as uh, we come around for the next edition. Uh, but we do have some feedback from uh, our podcast on the 22nd of May. Uh, so Lloyd92 says, he's really interested in learning about and having a decent knowledge on the terms and reasons behind calibration and he'd love to complete a novice course uh, if it becomes available and the mechanics behind it uh, can be sorted out so that is something that we are talking about we're looking at putting on a training course for professionals but also for you guys out there who want to do it on uh, an enthusiast basis and just learn a little bit more about what calibration is, why we do it, why it's important and the tools that you need and so on. So uh, we are working on that with the PVA. We we'll hope to put something together in the UK very soon. Um, and we'll have more details on that Lloyd uh, as soon as we have them for you guys. But that is in the pipeline and it is something we are looking to do very soon. Uh, and feedback, most of this is for Ed. So Ed, I'm going to hand over to you at this point because this product just absolutely uh, flew out the door. We we, weren't ex we ex thought it was going to be popular, but not mm. quite as popular as it has been. So that's the Zidu uh, Ever Solo DMP A6. So lots of feedback on this one. Yeah, we're north of 30,000 views on it now. It's demented. I mean, that's television numbers, and frankly, I'm uncomfortable with it. You know, you should <laughs> go back to viewing my stuff in small quantities. Um, yeah, there's a load of questions for this. Brilliantly, the first question answers the second question. Pellman comments, I contacted the UK Ever Solo distributors in Scotland. They've been overwhelmed with orders worldwide. They'll have huge numbers coming in the fourth batch, but that's after June. So Hardeep Sim wants to, Singh sorry, wants to know where are the people ordering this from, from the UK. There is a UK distributor. Um, I will drop that into the comments thread on the podcast. It's in the gargantuan comments thread on the actual review, but there's, you know, several hundred other comments to wade through, so I'll put it there as well. Um, a number of UK dealers have picked it up. I'd love to say that's on the strength of my review, but no, they know a good thing when they can see it. So uh, yeah, it, there's a, a, a good few retailers have now got it and there's some sort of direct sales arrangement going on as well. Um, Lars Adelstein asks, can you play internet radio on the unit? Yes, you can. The default internet radio app is 
adequate, uh, but some end users are having a reasonable amount of success uh, running BBC Sounds and other things so directly on the unit, not through it um, on Bluetooth or AirPlay, actually from uh, it, by installing the app. Is it for, uh, Miami Jim queries? If I'm casting from my Android phone to the player, can I cast apps such as Mixcloud or Soundcloud? You can't. Uh, at the moment, cast is about the only thing that this thing cannot do, um, and whether that's added is unclear. It doesn't seem to be a big priority for Zidoo at the moment. Um, Clont123, uh, is it possible to download Cobus tracks onto the device itself and play? I'm asking because my internet connection stutters at times. It is not. Um, there are hoops of many shapes and sizes that you need to jump through to have offline storage as part of the device and as far as i can see that's not practical to do on this so you are going to have to find another way of doing that you can obviously store them on your phone and airplay them to it um which would be stable up to a point um and then finally zorel ski puts the cat amongst the pigeons and asks succinctly is this a hi-fi rose knockoff no it's not um Zidu has had their own way of building uh, media boxes. They were doing media boxes long before I got involved looking at anything from an audio perspective. Hi-Fi Rose is a similar organization, but Hi-Fi Rose has used an older Android platform, which they've changed beyond recognition to be the complete fascia and control point of their units. They do have video outputs, but it's only to access their own unique content, essentially, and specific parts of YouTube and Tidal music videos. The Zidu Alpha players are fully paid up media boxes that just happen to have a decent audio side to them. And the Eversolo is an audio player that has an HDMI out, but specifically for multi-channel DSD and things like that. They are similar. There's obviously overlap. There's overlap all over the two-channel market, but they are not copying each other. They are different entities doing different things. Okay. Well, hopefully that answers all the questions uh, succinctly. Thank you very much, Ed. Uh, any more questions on that, then, of course, there is the comments thread, or, again, uh, you can get your comments in on the thread underneath this podcast. So before we get on with the show tonight, uh, we need to find out what the team have been up to. We haven't been around since the 22nd. Uh, so, Martin, what have you been doing? Uh, another short trip to Cornwall, which was very welcome, south coast this time. And actually, on the way back, I went to pick up my two Parasound power amplifiers, HCA series from the late 90s, which regularly seem to have uh, oxidized output relays and blown transistors of various descriptions. But anyway, they are all back up and running again, and it's a lot cheaper keeping the old steam-driven beasts going. Okay, good stuff. Uh, mm, who am I going to pick on? Jules, I know you've had an interesting week. What have you been up to? Well, um, played at Carrow Road um, again. So, so just for uh, our American guests, you may, you maybe have to explain what Carrow Road is and where it is. <laughs> Why it is? <laughs> it, it, it's probably cool. help here. It is the mecca of the east <laughs> uh, of East Anglia. It's on the arse end of England. Um, so it's another way of describing it. But uh, no, it's a uh, it's the it's the home of Norwich City Football Club. So this is soccer with the round ball. And um, yeah, it's the team that myself and Ian are devoted to. And I actually bumped into Delia, um, Ian, and Stuart wow. Weber, and Stuart Weber, uh, and uh, Michael Wynne Jones as well, coming out of, uh, out of the restaurant. So I had a bit of a chat. Um, nice. That, that, was we were buying. that was interesting. Um, and then I did a driving experience just yesterday, uh, which was very interesting as well, doing Lamborghinis and aerial atoms which sounds like a washing powder to me and and, and that was all interesting and today I had a very nice day with a habitat distributor in the hands of dave bonnage and craig wheeler saw uh, the new a, a christy a very nice christy projector that they're now starting to distribute that was a fantastic experience as well so excellent exciting excellent. times I, I do love the driving experience so which cars did you drive i uh, did the porsche 911 uh did the uh aston martin db9 the uh, Lamborghini Huracan, yeah, um, and this Ariel Atom thing, which is like a souped-up go kart, but it was insane. I had a last lap with a professional driver. <laughs> I think my soul, <laughs> my spirit, is still on the track somewhere, left behind. It was just yeah. an out-of-body experience. It was scary. You can't beat you, took... you can't beat taking the bodywork off something for the sensation of oh. speed. I find. Yeah. Well, I, I was on a driving thing a few weeks ago and had one of those going round, and the speed that they were going, it was just. Oh, I'd have been sick. Yeah, yeah. Those yeah. kind of G forces. But sounds like you had fun. Um, right, Ian, you've been uh, out 
outdoors or are you still playing games? Well, obviously, with the glorious sunshine that we've been enjoying, I've been making the absolute most of it by staying in, um, watching <laughs> lots of sports on TV. And uh, also, I thought, you know, um, Power Wash Simulator wasn't quite exciting enough. Anymore. So I, what I've done, I've moved on to uh, a game called Railway Empire 2 instead. <laughs> for the nice. Things, I'm now playing trains for fun. Can you. you send me a link to that, please? Gen- <laughs> oh, genuinely, you've got my email. I, I do quite like those things. It, it, um, it's, yeah, it's... I mean, for the, it's a bit of a, well, it's a bit of an age thing, but I just remember a game ages ago called A-Train that was on the Amiga. Yes, like, I had that as way, well. Way, way back. And uh, yeah, I loved it at the time, and I never haven't found a decent train sim since. So I think every time I see one now, I think, oh, it could be a bit like a train. So I get back into it. And yeah, it, it's quite good fun. I think I'm not sure what platforms it's on. It, it's I'm playing it on Xbox. It's on Xbox Game Pass. I'm sure there's now, plenty of platforms if it involves trains. When you scare all week, folks, don't forget yeah, to get your but, waitress. Yeah, so I, I'm literally just putting down tracks, watching trains going back and yes. forth, making sure that basically they all run on time. So, yeah. And if they don't, do you get nationalized? Yeah. <laughs> Not that this is relevant to anything on this show, but my first career was in video games. I worked for Sierra Online. Ooh. So oh. I worked on a lot of old games which you may or may not have played, but <laughs> most notably Leisure Suit Larry 7. That's, Ooh. The, that's, oh, that's, you're talking. <laughs> that's my big credit. Yeah. I was the. Uh, yeah. I played that at an age where I didn't understand any of the jokes, <laughs> but it was a tremendously entertaining thing. So, you know. <laughs> I just saw Al. Actually, he lives uh, right near me. So I, I just saw Al Lowe, the creator of Leisure Suit Larry. Um, he is retired and living in it, uh, Bellevue, Washington, and I have lunch with him every once in a while. So nice. Excellent. Yeah. So there you go. Well, that's uh, that's what the team have been up to. Um, before we go on, cunt competitions. Uh, I haven't picked a victim for this. Um, Jules, why don't you uh, tell us all about the current competitions that are running? Okay, open to all. You can win £500 to spend with MPB, the buying, selling, and trading platform used for photo and video kit. You can win the, I've never heard of this before, the Spears and Munsell 2023 Ultra HD Benchmark Disc Plus and LX1 Bias Lighting Strip, both courtesy of Scenic Lab. Three bundles to win and open to everyone worldwide. And exclusive like offers an for patrons, yeah. including Knock at the Cabin Door on 4K UHD Blu ray. Uh, Star Trek Strange New World Season 1 Limited Edition 4K Blu-ray Steelbook, Brotherhood of the Wolf on 4K UHD Blu-ray, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania on 4K UHD Blu-ray, Cocaine Bear on 4K UHD Blu-ray, The Changeling on 4K UHD Blu-ray, and Official Scream 6 Hoodie, Shazam Fury of the Gods on 1080p Blu-ray, so... Head over to AV Forums forward slash competition to enter, and all competitions are open to eligible AV Forums members or patrons resident in the UK. Uh, apart from the the uh, Spears and Mantle competition, we are doing that worldwide. So if you're anywhere on the planet, the guys are mm-hmm. kindly going to post that out to you. So, um, yeah, if you're watching anywhere in the world, get yourself entered into that, and we'll talk a little bit more about it very soon. Uh, previous hardware competition winners, Ed, who's won things? Oh, God, now you've got me. I'd moved away from the screen because I thought I was safe. <laughs> right, S. Banger uh, want a pair of Shure Ionic 50 premium wireless noise cancelling headphones worth £219, uh, courtesy of AV.com. And uh, the one that we were all hoping to win, Ashen Fee, uh, won the Philips 65 OLED 807 Ambilight TV worth 2,000 boys, courtesy of Philips. So well done, you lucky sod. Um, uh, I hope you enjoy your prizes, gentlemen. And finally, some new patrons have joined the fold. Martin, why don't you tell us who the new patrons are? Yeah, the new patrons are Rusty Chain, John Macklin, and Adrian Price. Well, thank you very much, guys, for your support. It's great to have you on as patrons. Uh, and, yeah, thank you very much for your support. Right, I think it's time to get on with the show. So we have two very special guests with us tonight. Uh, Welcome along, Don and Stacey Spears and Munsell. Um, Now, for those of you who've been into this hobby a very long time, you'll know that name. You'll know exactly what the guys do. But guys, um, for those that are maybe new to the world of uh, home theatre or TVs and so on, um, maybe just explain who you are and what it is that you guys do. I'll take it. Uh, <laughs> we make uh, 
we have been making for quite a few years a calibration and test and evaluation disk or disk set uh, for you know calibrating and evaluating primarily video but also some amount of audio um, it's designed to help you set all the settings on a television uh, to figure out which modes are going to be most optimal what modes to set on your player and generally get the entire signal chain as optimized as you can now these discs have been around a, a long time going all the way back to just sdr you know rec 709 100 nits that kind of thing but we're in a completely different world to when you guys started out stacy so what have the challenges been in terms of keeping up with everything that's, that's changing and and how much uh input does the industry have in what you're doing how much uh in, you know backwards and forwards is there in terms of standards and and what it is that you guys are trying to do so there's actually an effort uh, from I think ICDM or IDS um, trying to standardize test patterns. The problem with that is it's made up of several different groups of people, especially display manufacturers, and they often can't agree on what they want. So while we do listen to some of their input, we kind of go our own way as well. But we're constantly, uh, you know, getting feedback from reviewers and display manufacturers and people, you know, people such as yourself to figure out what we can put on the disc that would be most useful. And you know, going from the into the HDR world where we have various uh, different iterations of the technology, HDR, HDR10+, plus, Dolby Vision, what kind of challenges uh, have they given you in terms of, you know, putting these patterns together and making sure that you have all the bases covered? Well, with SDR, we had years and years or decades even of people that have been designing test patterns. But with HDR, this is sort of all brand new. So we're sort of all learning on the fly together as an industry. But I was I sort I'll, of lucky. Oh, so, I was, no good. I was gonna say I was sort of lucky because I started in 2014 when I was at SpectraCal, and this is even before HDR launched. And so we had partnered with Dolby. So we sort of had a jump start uh, ahead of everyone else. Um, in SDR, also, I think more stuff was standardized. There was a uh, there were standards for a whole bunch of things that are still in flux in HDR to some extent, like this, this tone mapping algorithms, most notably, and that, that has a significant effect on the final picture when you can have, you're trying to master content for stuff that goes, could go as uh, or for a display that could only do say 300 nits or 600 nits or 1000 nits, or now we're seeing displays that go up to maybe 2000 nits peak. Um, and we've, of course, seen content on professional displays that go as high as 4,000 nits. It's very hard to make one set of content that looks good on all of those different displays. So it's, that's a real new world um, as far as, uh, you know, trying to design test patterns that will help, you know, figure out what's going on and help uh, set up your television to get the most out of this content. No. Going back to my past, and I'm going to bring another guys in to ask some questions in a moment, but um, just from my point of view, in terms of a, a beginner, and we've all been there, you know, we've all been at the point where this is new to us and so on, picking up one of your benchmark discs and putting up a test pattern, how can people who are just getting into the hobby or just taking an interest in video, how do they know what it is that they're looking at and what they're supposed to be seeing? What kind of help do you give them? So I think that was one of the things that set us apart with our very first disc, and that was sort of pop-up help. So as you're looking at a pattern, you could press the up arrow, which is now the down arrow on the current disc, and it would actually bring up a short description, and in some cases, actual sample images of right and wrong, or good and bad. And what kind of feedback done do you get from end users, and how does that uh, impact on, on how you design your new set of patterns? I think we've been lucky enough that most of the feedback has been pretty good, but in, with each disc, we do get a certain amount of feedback from people that are real new to the to AV calibration and who, you know, been confused by something. It's very, it's very hard to um, know exactly what people won't know, if, if that makes any yeah. sense. One of the mm -hmm. hardest things is knowing what it's like to not know something that you know. So we've each each disc we've tried to incorporate that into the booklet or the help text or both to articles on our website and tried to make sure that while we're 
putting on patterns that are designed, there are patterns on the disc that are designed for uh, evaluators, reviewers, uh, manufacturers even. Uh, there's plenty of patterns and plenty of content for people that are brand new that really goes step by step and helps them you know, walk through setting all the settings and adjusting everything appropriately for the television and their player. Um, so hopefully this fourth one, this is it. This is, we got it perfect this time. This is, <laughs> it's never going to be better. Is, is that true? Is it perfect? Uh, at this point, I want to say that there's, that's it. We're, you know, it's been four <laughs> years of making this disc and we really did. I mean, with every disc, we put everything we've got into it. We never leave anything on the floor. You know, we, we, but I'm sure that in a year, I, Stacy just sent me an email this morning saying, Hey, you know, somebody want to do this other pattern, which we right now we don't have the code for, but let's, let's think about <laughs> this, you know, maybe we could do these other patterns for this other thing. And I'm like, ah, but you know, <laughs> yeah. it, I don't, I don't know that there's going to be another disc set though, for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, as everybody has noted, we're sort of moving into streaming. And yeah, other and this was the next platforms. question I had for you guys. Um, yeah. Shiny discs seem to be, they're, they're holding in there, but, you know, as people find it easier and easier, it's the convenience of streaming, uh, you know, it's funny, streaming is objectively lower quality. Like, even the highest quality streaming just isn't the same bit rate as a, as a Blu-ray can be, a, you know, UHD Blu-ray, the bit rates are just tremendous. And people have gone through scene by scene, shot by shot, and um, optimized the compression and really made it just perfect whereas streaming it's all being done by automated um systems and there's the quality control is a little slapdash i'd say um but it's so convenient you know it's super convenient and you're paying a monthly fee to get all this content so i think a lot of people get their entertainment now from streaming and that is you know cutting into the uh a, you know the usage of shiny discs but for enthusiasts like us you know, shiny discs still are the quality standard. And I think for, you know, for people that care a lot about video, you know, they want the best possible video they can get. If you're going to, you know, watch TV or watch cinema in the best possible way, you really want your television to be set up properly and you want to be using the right modes and so forth. Yeah. Uh, just to add to what Don said, you know, when you, if you were to watch the same Blu-ray disc three times, it's the same experience each time. But if you stream the same movie three times, it may be different each time just because of bandwidth fluctuation. Yeah. Yeah. It is one of those problems, isn't it? I mean, the, the convenience side is is obviously what people uh, love about it. And and even, you know, people like myself, you know, now and again, do I get up and go and try and find the disc or, you know, that film's now playing on this streaming service. Do I just click the button and watch the film? It's... It's a convenient side. So uh, before I bring other guys in, because you've touched on this point and it was a question I wanted to raise. So let's just keep the subject in the same area. When it comes to uh, making sure that the video quality is the best it can be on a streaming service, what do you guys have in mind with that? You know, is your next product something that's developed that is uh, streaming wise and, and setting up a, you know, your test patterns or your, your generators that way to, to test things is that is that the future so we've talked to different streaming companies but they want patterns not for streaming to customers but for actual internal development and testing so they're having yeah. to put patterns on the service but only for like internal use not so much for public consumption the other issue is how do you manage all of this content i think years ago we were working with xbox and we were sort of treating it as seasons like a tv series is how you because they don't really have a ui design for custom projects like this uh, but right. for something like an Apple TV, you can run an app like Infuse and you can have patterns of local storage and play them that way. You could certainly put them, you know, just pick a few patterns like the video setup patterns or a subset of patterns for setting a few things on a streaming service. Uh, one of the trickier questions with some of these patterns is how effective are they after they've been stepped on by, you know, the encoding pipeline of these streaming yeah. services? Uh, some of them will probably survive okay that work um others i don't know there's certainly some patterns that i i don't know how you could ever make them work on a streaming service that just it's not going to happen but they might not be as relevant to a streaming service so it's something worth considering there's also some interesting 
you know, downloadable services out there where people are doing higher bit rate and you can, you know, you, you essentially have a local cached copy and they can, you know, keep the quality high, but I don't know where that's going to go. I mean, we may have to wait until things settle a little bit and there's a clear, um, you know, marketplace that's going to be optimized for what we want to do. You know, the, the, when, when, when most enthusiasts are on one particular platform, if it's beyond UHD discs, um, we will go to that platform, you know, where yeah. there's a demand for test patterns, we will find, you know, <laughs> we'll go there. Yeah. And to Don's point about some patterns might not survive, well, this might be a case also where some patterns might show what the services are doing, and they may not mm. want you to know what they're doing in certain cases. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's that side of things, isn't it? Uh, uh, right, true. So, so I'll open up the floor um, to the other guys. So uh, Jules, do you want to yeah. have any questions uh, you want to ask? I've obviously found the discs invaluable in my professional uh, life as a calibrator. Um, and if anybody tries to take away the horses in the snow scene, uh, I, they, they, they've got to get past me first. Um, it's been, you know, that's the, that is the, the, the pattern that I use so often uh, to looking at the tone mapping on, on different displays. Um, so there is, is a company. There is a Sorry. company that did not. There is a company that did not like us having that pat, that particular shot on there, and I refused oh. to remove it. Well, I'm glad you didn't. Me, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, but it, what you're saying is 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 a it's an increasing problem for me professionally. Is that even in high end installations, I cannot assume there's a Blu-ray player there. Hmm. Um, I went to one just recently, and um, guys got. Terrific speakers, really expensive projector, lovely projection system, everything. But he's only using an NVIDIA shield as his source. And thinking, what? You know, um, and uh, that turns out it was down to sort of customer education because he thought, well, it's 4K. So, you know, it's got to be, you know, 4K is 4K. It's got to be as good as a UHD Blu ray, that's, surely. That's so, one better than 3K. So, I mean, yeah. <laughs> And, and the other problem is, you know, uh, so you can't assume. So I've got my Spears and Munsell in my bag, but there's no player to play it on. Um, so to have, for example, um, the disc available on something like Kaleidoscape uh, would be helpful. I don't know whether it is available. I've not searched for it, but um, that would be useful for installers to be able to put that on the, on the Kaleidoscape on the installation. Um, and that is a solid service, so that, that would work. Um, Having it on my Meridio 7G um, pattern generator would also be useful. I know it's the, there's some there's some inclusion there already, but as you're expanding these discs, I wonder whether that's going to get an upgrade and whether we're going to get these patterns on that available more on that as well. So that be that would be useful because we obviously I'm carrying that around with me all the time. So um, so yeah, so there, have it available. There is a popular piece of hardware, and there is a an app coming for it. Um, and we've tested our content through that app. So there is a possibility in the future. And it's a very popular piece of hardware, but not much we can say on that right now. Because mm -hmm. yeah. the company releasing it might get upset at us. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah so I'd just say disks are becoming, it's yeah. becoming increasingly, they're, they're found less often in, even in high-end installations. People are going that streaming route, unfortunately. You know, in the mm. case, so we've, we've had several people ask us about Kaleidoscape specifically. Mm -hmm. So if there, are, <clears throat> if there are a group of patterns that would be most useful for you on Kaleidoscape, that would probably actually be very helpful because mm -hmm. then we can at least get an initial set out there. Yeah, yeah. That, that, I believe that Kaleidoscape be... is also very interested. Yeah, that, that'd be very helpful. One, you know, I mean, one nice thing about Blu-ray or about the shiny disc is that the whole industry got together and they set a standard and, you, you know, all these different manufacturers produced hardware and, you know, it wasn't perfect, but tens of millions of people have, you know, some kind of shiny disc player, hundreds of millions of people have a shiny disc player, tens of millions, in, at least in this country have, you know, Blu-ray players and so forth. So we, you know, it's a lot of work for us to optimize all the content for the specific format. We have a lot of stuff on this disc where we have, you know, iterated and gone through and sort of worked around limitations of Blu-ray and the specific stuff about Blu-ray and about their encoding and about the way it's formatted. So for each new format, we have to sort of dig in on that. And if it doesn't have tens of millions of users, then, you know, it, it it's a lot of time and a lot of effort to 
you know, you'd like to think that, oh, now that we've got this pattern all done, it's just easy to port it over to a different place. And sometimes it's not too bad. Other times it's, a, it's, it's quite a bit of work. Stacy often points out that um, each of the patterns is nine frames long. Each of the static patterns, the still patterns, we actually encode it as a video file that's nine frames long where it plays through the nine frames and then pauses. And there's an interesting story about why it's nine frames long. But um, if you put that on a streaming player and you hit play, it would just play and then immediately go away. You know, nine frames isn't, is a fraction of a second. Um, because they don't have the ability to play, you know, to have put in an auto pause. That's a feature of Blu-ray. And if we had to extend all of those to say a minute, um, that would be a lot more encoding. You know, this disc required months and months of computer time. And this is, Stacy has a really tricked out encoding rig that is very, very fast. And it still took months of just encoding time, not even our time. So now I will <clears throat> quickly mention that this app I alluded to earlier, it's actually able to play the nine frame files and pause in the last frame as well. So they actually Ooh. took files off the disk as a test, so. Nice. Now this right. particular, our patterns in Dolby Vision though don't work on this device because they only support certain profiles and we don't have that profile. But <laughs> HDR10 works great. <laughs> So, you know, each time there's a, there's potentially a different encoding and a lot of research to figure out what are the specifics of this device? What are the specifics of its decoder? Um, how does it work? You know, can, can the tricks we use to make the Blu-ray work right? Will they carry over? Will we have to come up with new tricks? And for some patterns, it's not, it's not as big a deal as others. It's, you know, it, I think the right thing to do is find, you know, is to pick a subset that is useful and see about getting it onto a different device, see what the uptake is for that, whether people like it, whether people use it, and then maybe start thinking about moving over other things as, as people request them, or as it seems like, you know, there's an uptake. Any other questions, Jules? Um, um, that was the main one, really. That's, that's the, the, the main practical issue that we're finding is that, you know, yeah. it's just, you know, we've got this disc, but there's nothing to play on. You know, obviously, you know, I, I can carry a disc player in my car and plug it into the system, <laughs> but it just, just shows you how things are going. Yeah. Um, mm. you, have, you can have a very, very high-end system, but no disc player anymore. Yeah. And mm. um, so how we adapt to that changing environment and 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 have have the references uh there in front of us to be able to calibrate properly is is a challenge mm. martin do you want to come in with any questions at this point um i'm ashamed to say i don't uh own the disc so i'll have to obviously have to rectify that um i do have a couple of legacy thx discs and the disney wow but uh not your good selves disc at this point um, but my understanding is it's uh, pretty comprehensive. Oh, it's definitely the reference. It's yeah, I, I think so. as, as you can see. I mean, it's never off the system here when I'm reviewing anything. You know, the, the first thing oh, yeah. that goes on it is yeah. is the montage. You know, I've, I know it so well now. Yeah. Um, and Jules will be the same working yeah. on these things every single day. The, yeah. You know, it's the tools there are, are amazing, and, and what I do like, guys, is that you take feedback on board and if we come up with an idea for you know how do i test this this seems to be an issue i've noticed it with uh bits of content here and there how do we create something to try and uh you know generate that on a pattern you guys listen you you go away you do the development and usually you come back with something that that will do the trick yeah i think we met at the c9 launch event or at ces yeah, or nap yeah. And you had requested a specific pattern, and we were able to get it on the disc that year, which was the full mm -hmm. array local dimming pattern. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and you know that's that's really one of the things that does stand out. You know, you listen to the professional side, you listen to the enthusiast, you listen to the guy in the street. If he's got an interest, an idea for a pattern, it's great that uh, that both of you go away and you work on these things and and come back with something that that usually works. So yeah. So I have a question for you though, since you're doing a review of the display behind you. Uh, were you able to run our new pixel aging pattern on it? Not yet. Okay, because basically that pattern was designed for OLEDs. You want to run it for a hundred hours, and it breaks the display in. Excellent. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and again, you know, and and I want to try and stress this. You know, even though 
I use the montage footage and certain patterns on the desk that work for me. There is so much content on these desks. Um, yeah. You know, where where did you guys find the time to to put? Because we're, we're not talking like a small upgrade. You've gone from one desk to putting everything over three desks. Um, that just shows you how much content. Nice so on. the previous disc had around 1,200 video files on it. This new disc has a little over 5,000. And so over the past four years, I kept hoping we'd finish and I'd be able to take a vacation, but every vacation I was working on this. So finally, this July, I will get two weeks off where I will be on vacation. <laughs> Some of this is that, um, you know, we, since creating and mastering and burning the disc is such a huge undertaking, we never want to leave anything off. If we have a new idea or we think, oh, you know, maybe we should cover another matrix, you know, the, the 5,000 files, it's not 5,000 separate patterns. It's more like, the same pattern with different peak luminance, yeah. the, the same pattern in different formats, the same pattern, um, you know, with some variation, um, an HD version of some of the patterns, you know, there's the matrix gets very big. You had one more variation or one more axis and suddenly you've got to encode a ton more patterns. Um, but yeah, we kept coming up with new ideas. People, you know, Phil, you gave us a suggestion for full array local dimming. Thanks for that. You delayed the disc by like <laughs> probably a day right there. There you are. No. Uh, and, and the thing is, I though, kid. it becomes so useful just having, you know, you know, you've got an idea in your head and you just think, yeah, I need, I need that. Can you guys do it? And it was great. I think I mentioned it at CES and the disc was out that summer, wasn't it? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a quick turnaround on that. So, yeah. But I mean, there's, there's, there's patterns on there that um, obviously, unless you've got a meter, are not going to be much use to you. There's things you can do by eye, do yeah. your pluge patterns and, and other things. And there's patterns that I've never even looked at because as when I'm doing a, a calibration, they're not relevant to me um, as opposed to a reviewer who's going to right. want to test other materials. So so Phil's probably been into sections of the, the previous disc that you know I've never really sort of even don't give up, yeah. you know, I've, I've looked yeah. at them in passing, but on a, on a daily basis, it's not very useful to me. So if you're expanding on that lot, um, it does sound like a, a real labyrinth of content that you've got on these, yeah. on these three discs. And, and I guess that the reason I, I, I raised this said is to put people who are listening or, or, or watching and, and who think, my God, this just sounds like a lot of technical and, and I don't want to get into it. Look guys, there's, there's things on this disc that I don't understand. I look at the test part and I think, actually i don't know what this is trying to do and i have to refer to the book you know and i do this every day of the week um so well, you, you know i don't i don't want you guys listening in so i'm thinking right this day yeah, you're really helping to sell the disc here, i don't know it's like i don't know what this disc does man it's crazy yeah, yeah. What, what is this there is good one and and, and I, i'm hoping that that puts people's mind at rest because they're not picking this up and thinking well i don't know how to use this well you, we think you in do terms know how of, to use it. Yeah. Yes, we think in terms of three different users. Uh, there's users that don't have any test equipment, don't have a huge background. They just want to get the disc and hopefully both be able to set up their TV as best they can without equipment and maybe learn some things. You know, there's there's patterns that you still might want to go through just looking at it and sort of learning about what it tells you. But, you know, there's a whole section that's just stuff that, you can learn from just with your eyes and stuff that you can use to set things up just with your eyes. Then there's calibrators like Julian who, you know, are going to want patterns that are for use with test patterns for calibrating, for setting grayscale and various other things, setting up the CMS. And then there's patterns for evaluators. Yeah. And I suppose in the, you know, in the, uh, perfect world, we would generate three separate SKUs, you know, three separate discs, you know, just a, a simple disc, kind of like the Disney Wow disc that is really for the novice and enthusiast. And then we'd have something for calibrators, you know, calibration package, which would be expensive because that'd be a very niche market. And then something for evaluators, which might even be more expensive because that's even more niche market possibly. I don't know which one is more niche. You can fight that out, <laughs> you know, later, whether, you know, reviewers or calibrators would need to pay more, but it sort of made sense to us to just make one, one yeah. package that has everything on it. And yes, if you're uh, an enthusiast who doesn't want to buy test equipment and is not interested in evaluating, although I don't, I don't know. I don't know anybody who's an enthusiast of home theater who isn't interested in evaluating things like, um, 
you know, one of the handy things is if you need a justification for buying a new piece of equipment, man, you know, some of these patterns will, will help you do that. You yeah. can bring your wife in and say, hey, look at this. This is terrible. Look at this artifact here. This is a problem. I need a new TV. This is... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, and, husband, and if you're in the or husband, and if you're in the market wanna... for a new TV, yeah. right? If you're in the market for a new TV, then that's when you would probably use the evaluation patterns. And you can take the disc down to your local TV; they will really appreciate it. And, you know, but <laughs> a, a good AV, um, yeah, absolutely, store will yeah. will say, "Hey, I want to take a look at a disc of my own on this," and they'll generally, you know, as long as it's you know good, it's not Costco. Well, you don't have Costco there, do you? Oh, you have yeah, yes, we do. Yeah. Oh, and well, there you go. Uh, whatever the your high street um, <laughs> AV companies, you know, one would hope that they would let you view uh, a disc or you want to go to a friend's house and see how their player or their TV is working. You can bring your disc. Um, so the evaluation stuff is, I think, useful for lots of people, not just reviewers. Uh, manufacturers use it. Certainly we get feedback from reviewers. We get feedback from manufacturers. Um, <laughs> We have at times gotten feedback from manufacturers. They say, can you make a pattern that makes our competitors look bad? Could you? <laughs> I, I, I believe no, we, li we literally had a TV manufacturer say, hey, we identified an artifact that our competitors have that we wow. don't. Could you make a <laughs> pattern that just shows that artifact? And Stacy and I thought, well, it's a real artifact. It's a problem. I guess, yeah, we made that pattern. You know, <laughs> We should have contacted that television company and said, hey, do you know anything that... <laughs> This other company does that your television doesn't. Yeah. How much would you pay us to make your competitors look bad? No, but nobody paid us for that. We should have. We should have held out for more money. What did? Why didn't we do that? Anyway. Um, so, guys, just as a final word, and uh, just to wrap up on this for today. But um, if people are, and and I've tried to get across there that people shouldn't be daunted by. You know, purchasing this disc and trying to use it. So, what would you say to, you know, the different users out there who uh, are maybe thinking about, you know, looking at the benchmark disc and and getting it? What what would you, you say that they will get from it? You'll get knowledge. You will know what settings actually are giving you the best, cleanest picture. You will know. I mean, every television and every player now has just like a gazillion settings, and nobody knows what they do. Frankly, we don't always know what they do. Um, you know, you've got all these things you can turn on with cryptic names or marketing driven yeah. names, you know, like super reality creation plus, oh. you know, oh. what the hell is super re reality creation plus? What happens if I turn it on? What happens if I turn it off? Well, with this disc, you will be able to find out what it's doing to the picture. You can put up, a, you know, patterns and we have instructions, you know, the color space evaluation pattern is kind of a misnamed. We call we originally created it for evaluating what color space you put the player into, but honestly, that's a great pattern. You put it up, turn on and off features on the TV and watch the pattern change. If the pattern doesn't change, probably it's doing nothing. At least it's not doing <laughs> anything to, to static images. It may be a motion setting. Mm -hmm. It may be that it's affecting something else. But that pattern is a kind of a torture test for video. It's got super high frequency. It's got um, RGB legal and RGB illegal all the way out to the ranges. It's got smooth gradations. There's all kinds of things that if you step on the video in any way, it will show up on that pattern. So you can put up that pattern and start turning features on and off, moving the sharpness up, moving the sharpness down, changing various things and watch that pattern change. And hopefully by reading the notes and looking at what you're supposed to be looking for in that pattern, you can start to answer the question, but which of these modes looks right which one looks the best you know you can see detail appearing and disappearing and generally more detail good you know when when you turn on a mode and the detail disappears on that pattern that's detail that's disappearing on your video on your your films that you're trying to watch and that's going to apply that setting is going to be sure you know you, you're hooking up to a blu-ray player but that setting will be useful to know about for all of your inputs, including your streaming inputs and various other things. You're, if it's if it's be looks better with it off, you're going to want to turn it off for all of your inputs and all of your modes. So that's my rant. I think so, that's what it's, that's what there it's is good one for. A, there is one other thing that most discs don't have, and that's we actually have every HDR format supported on the disc yes, for yeah. demo yeah. material. Yeah. 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 So that's, a, that's can... a very useful feature. 
and and what I love now, guys, is is that you can change it on the fly now. Uh, you know, oh. you don't have to come out and go back into the menu. Okay. You can use the cursor key and change to Dolby Vision or HDR10 if the player uh, accepts it. I mean, that's a great feature, especially you know if you're evaluating something and just being able to to change it very quickly. Um, yeah, and, and in that feature, what I like to do is start at the 10,000 nit HDR10 and then yeah. just press like go to the horses in the snow scene, press the right arrow, it'll jump down to 1000, press it again, it'll go to 600. And it tries to stay at that same area as you're jumping between formats. So you can easily quickly compare the two formats or the different formats. Something that was not trivial to do, by the way, (laughs) on on (laughs) Blu-ray. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Um, And you, you got a great team behind you as well. So it's not just you two guys, is it? I mean, you've, you've had a lot of help from the industry. Um, I know a lot of the, the montage footage here you've had specially shot for you um, to put onto the desk and so on. So it's not just the two of you. It's, it has been quite a, a large collaboration, hasn't it? It has. We've had a lot of people donate time. Um, Mark Fishman, who mixes a lot of shows for Netflix and HBO and other shows, he did all the Atmos mixing for us. And then Dolby, we worked with Dolby and DTS on getting both the Atmos and DTSX on there. So, yeah, lots of third-party help. Yeah, and uh, our very own... Used to be a TV reviewer here. David McKenzie helped you out as well, didn't he? David did all the authoring. Yeah, oh. So he he had the hardest part. <laughs> it took him, I think he spent almost two years authoring the disc because it was so complex. Yeah, yeah. Well, it looks great, guys. Um, thank you very much for coming on the podcast tonight. Uh, and if anybody out there um, has any questions for the guys, then please do uh, send them in and we'll forward them on and, and you know we'll come back with the answers uh, once we hear back from the guys so uh stacy don thank you very much for your time uh, this evening and um, we'll speak to you again soon in the future thank you all right thank you thanks for having, for having us, us. Thank yeah thanks Kelly. pleasure right so we are uh, we're going to move on now um and we're going to look at tv it's actually the tv that is uh, sitting behind me right now that's the uh, lg g3 mla oled evo review Right, so uh, lots of words there. Emily, micro lens array, uh, basically, and very quickly, just to get through what is it. It's actually billions of uh, micrometer convex uh, lenses that are attached to the pixel. Uh, And what does that give you? Well, in the past, an OLED panel lost more light than it actually put out towards the viewer. Uh, A lot of that light got lost within the innards of of the panel and of the TV. And what Emily does is it, focuses all that light that's usually lost inside the panel and pushes it back out towards the viewer. And the result is uh, LG display, uh, reckon it's 80% uh, more light coming directly at you as a viewer. And you can actually notice a difference. You just have to switch a G3 on. And if you're familiar with OLED, you will say, oh, actually, uh, that is pretty impressive. Um, Even in the most accurate picture mode, filmmaker mode, uh, I measured 1,300-odd nits on a 10% industry standard window. Uh, normally, for an OLED, you'd struggle to get 1,000 nits. Uh, last year's QD OLEDs were hitting 1,000, in, uh, and this is in an accurate picture mode. Now, you can shove it in Vivid, and it'll do 2,000 nits, but you don't want to watch that image. Uh, that image is just awful, um, but it will go a lot brighter, and you can measure a lot brighter. But if you're actually in uh, an accurate picture mode uh, to the standards as it was mastered and intended to be seen, you're getting 1,300-odd nits. uh, And that's consistent over the the 55 and 65-inch panel. Also in there is what LG Display called Meta and what LG Electronics call Brightness Booster Pro. Uh, Why they don't call them the same things, I, I don't know. You would think that, you know, they are separate companies, but under the same umbrella, you think they would name these things the same but they don't um and what that does is it's a it's an algorithm uh, that is based on the alpha uh, processor alpha 9 processor the gen 6 um and what it does is uh, it's looking at 20,000 separate zones uh, last year it was 5,000 so it has up significantly again this year uh, and what it does is it maps out the image it, it knows where the specular highlights need to be it knows uh, where the black level is, it knows exactly how much uh, mid-tone detail it needs to be showing uh, within a certain scene, and, and it applies that. And I've got to say, this is one of the TV, you know, those TVs that you look at and you just think, wow. And I do the, the comparisons. That's the Samsung uh, S95C sitting next to, you know, the G3. I, I have the luxury of doing side-by-sides here, and it really is a big leap up this year. Um, 
to the point that I, you know, you ask me which is better, QD OLED or, or MLA OLED, and, and I'll be struggling to, to tell you which one to go and buy, to, to be honest. It's, um, you know, you're, you're so close to um, each other in terms of picture quality, um, but then each one does something a little bit better than the other. So with the Samsung, uh, obviously it's got the color volume associated with, uh, you know, QD OLED, and it also does white a little bit nicer in my personal opinion. It's not as cyan blue uh, as, as a white pixeled OLED is. Um, but then those start to come down to personal preferences and what you prefer when you're looking at the image. And you don't see that when the TVs are not together. And I want to make this very clear. I think a lot of people have picked up on the comparison stuff and said, oh, you know, the LG looks green or it looks blue or whatever. Only when it's side by side with the QD. I mean, the QD OLED looks too red. It looks too magenta. Again, you don't see that when you're looking at the TV in isolation on its own. Only in comparisons will that may be obvious to you. And that's just because one's an RGB display and one's a WRGB display. Um, and it has that different look to it. Um, is it a TV that you should go and buy? Absolutely. If you can afford it and it does everything you want to do, and let's face it, it does gaming better than anything else on the market at this moment in time. The picture processing is now up there with Sony and everybody else. You know, Sony used to have the lead. I don't think that's the case now. Uh, this new processor, it was great last year. They've just improved it again this year. Motion's fantastic. Upscaling is excellent. You know, it's got everything that you could possibly want. Uh, smart TV, once you get rid of the advertising at the top, again, it's fast. It, it, it does what it says on the tin. But more importantly, HDR has real impact. Um, we always say, you know, peak brightness, don't you know, fascinate on the peak brightness of a display. There's more to it, but when you do have that peak brightness and when you do have the full screen brightness as well, and this is the important thing, you know, this is now a TV that I would recommend for a bright room. You know, you would get away with this TV in a bright room now. You don't have to rely on an LCD TV. And that was only ever the high end LCD TVs, you know, uh, lower down the market. They would only get 400 nits out of them anyway. So, yeah, it's a fantastic TV. It scored 10 out of 10. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. Some of the things drive you mad about this TV, like the remote. It's cheap. It's nasty. It's plastic. It's it's not a luxury item. It doesn't come with a stand in the box. It comes with a wall mount. Now, that made sense when the C and the G were the same TV, basically the same panel, same processor, same picture quality. They just the cosmetics were different. If you wanted a stand mount, you you purchased the C series. If you wanted a wall mount, you purchased the G gallery series. Um, that's not the case now. The G series is such a step up on C now that they're going to lose customers by not providing a, a stand in the box. And what they should be doing is two different SKUs. Uh, you go in the shop and you pick the one you want. You either buy the one with the expensive wall mount or you buy the one with the expensive uh, tabletop mount. Um, they're going to lose customers otherwise. Why am I going to pay that kind of money and get this really expensive wall mount in there as part of the package and then never use it and then have to go and pay another hundred quid for the LG stand if I want the LG stand and it's a bit, you know, not very sturdy um, and, and not very good quality. Or you do what I did with the 55 inch here and the 55 inch was supplied by Peter Tyson. It's a retail uh, TV. I went on to Amazon, I bought a 25 quid visa mount uh, with a glass bottom looks great um but why lg are not doing that out of the box with a luxury tv that you're spending a lot of money on that's a bit of a gripe so no it's not perfect 10 out of 10 though in terms of picture quality absolutely outstanding gaming wise uh, ian this is the gaming tv that you want to get your hands on uh, it is absolutely fantastic and it covers everything 4k 120 with dolby vision hdr uh, hgig uh, it does all that you know it's absolutely brilliant for hdmi 2.1 uh, 48 gigabits per second so the review is up on the website go and read the review uh, i have reviewed the 55 which is a retail sample I also reviewed the 65 which was provided by lg not a great deal of difference between the two tvs those who uh, maybe think that you know there's golden samples out there that manufacturers send out and maybe there is uh, but certainly between the retail set and the the manufacturer supplied set i didn't find any huge differences and in, in terms of the performance of both great tvs and the video review is also up on youtube as well if you uh, prefer to watch a video and then the video is up there so that's the lg g3 emily oled tv um it's a best in class that's not to say that this samsung sitting here is not a great tv it's absolutely brilliant the only thing with the samsung is 
picture processing is not quite as polished. Um, and that kind of lets the side down a little bit. And it's not quite as polished when it comes to gaming, even though it's got the four HDMI 2.1 inputs. Um, it misses the odd thing here. Now, there's a few little bits and pieces that are a little bit odd. But Jules, you'll be happy to know that there's no longer, uh, they no longer force the active uh, tone mapping on you all the time. You can actually, oh, excellent. You can Lovely. actually switch it off now and make it hard clip. So uh, they've obviously been listening to the industry on that one as well. So there you go. Uh, that's that review. And like I say, uh, the review's up on the website as well as the video. We're going to go to Home Cinema next. If you'd like to support the AV Forums podcast on a regular basis, then why not become a patron? Head over to patreon.com forward slash AV Forums to sign up. You can also make a one-off donation through the Super Chat or via streamlabs.com forward slash AV Forums. All donations help us to improve the website and the podcasts. Thank you to all our supporters. And of course, I was too quick there uh, in going to uh, the break, and I forgot that Ian had some news there. But actually, it fits in with home cinema, so we'll keep it in the home cinema. And it's it's a little bit of older news, which is obviously uh, content that's disappearing from Disney Plus uh, somewhere in May. And I believe that there might even be some more in June, Ian. So what's going on? What's, what's happening with this? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's not hugely unusual for streaming services to drop uh, films and TV shows from time to time, but this was kind of a rather more of a concerted effort from Disney Plus to try and save some money. So they've chopped uh, some fifty films and TV shows uh, at the end of last month. Um, it cost them something like one and a half billion dollars to do so, but in charges that is. Uh, but obviously, the idea is it will save them a lot more in the long run. But there's a few high-profile titles in there, such as. Uh, the new Willow series, which has only been on the service for six months. So if you haven't had a chance to watch that, uh, you're kind of out of luck. But obviously, all the big names will still be up there. So all your Marvel, all your Star Wars content, that's that's not going anywhere. Um, but uh, it does appear that there will be a few more shows going. Um, reports suggest that Disney have paid some more additional charges since then, but only about $400 million this time around. So it won't be quite as many shows. Uh, possibly leaving later on in this month but if you do have something on your watch list for disney plus now it'd be a good time to watch yeah and and this is something ed that we were discussing with uh don and stacy you know when it comes to you know physical media you own that media it's it's always there it's always on your on your shelf if you ever want to go and watch it yeah don't um, rely on it existing in the ether because no. it it well i mean certain things it probably going to be there most of the time but uh, i mean and this applies just as much to music uh stuff me uh stuff from smaller labels in particular it comes and goes from streaming services if you are 100 percent convinced that you're going to watch it repeatedly find a way to buy it um there's there, and that applies to video or audio because do not rely on it continuously being available on demand because no one is under yeah. any obligation to do so yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's one uh, issue when it comes to streaming. The other one is is one that um, I certainly got the email last month, end of last month, and that's from Netflix about households. You know, what is a household? And I, if you're sharing your password with other people who can access your account, uh, they want to clamp down on this because they want those other people to be subscribers. Uh, Martin, I can't help feeling that this is definitely the wrong way going around to try and solve this problem by um, sending out emails and basically telling people stop sharing your passwords especially when the company were encouraging it just three or four years ago yeah absolutely i mean um i i don't think that's a good marketing ploy by any stretch at all um i can't see how it's going to win new customers no, there's far better ways. And I know there's lots of boycotts going on uh, at the moment. Lots of people dropping their subscriptions, uh, jewels to Netflix, um, just out of protest, just it's, to make their feelings known. Well, it's a very competitive marketplace now, isn't it? I, mean, I don't like you guys. I'm, I'm streaming to, I'm, I'm, you know, Paramount and Amazon. And you know, so um, if they're putting a, a barrier, an obstacle in, in, in the place of people, um, using the Netflix service, um, then it, it's not going to go. I mean, they're losing subscribers, aren't they, anyway? Um, mm. As far as I understand, they're not growing. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure this is going to help them, and it's going to create a, a bad taste in, in certain people's mouths. That um, uh, At a time, also, let's remember, it's a cost of living crisis, yeah. and the cost of all these subscriptions adds up. Um, yeah. So which one are we going to lose? I, I guess... 
you know, for me, what put my back up, and I think put a lot of people's uh, back up, Ed, was the fact that they encouraged this. Mm. They said a number of years ago, hey, you know, who are you sharing your password with this week? Type of, you know, and that was their... Uh-huh. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of... Uh, I'm sufficiently cynical that I didn't think that was ever going to last forever. I think Netflix's problem... Uh, and it's specific to Netflix um, because the other services haven't been as guilty of it and they have slightly different rules. Is the It comes hot on the heels of, think of a Netflix drama, and almost everyone has watched a Netflix drama, which they got quite into and was then inexplicably knocked in the, on the head some way well short of when it was supposed to be. And if you've managed to antagonize your customer base by doing that on the regular, we've reached a point now where I will not watch a serialized drama on Netflix on the off chance that I enjoy it and they don't let it reach a satisfactory conclusion. I still have a Netflix subscription. I watch documentaries and I watch legacy stuff that's on there. Uh, But I won't commit to anything new. Now, if you're doing that at the same time as you're, you know, doing this password stuff, essentially you are inviting collectively people to pay more whilst you're coming off a, a track record of offering them less and when you do that that that, that generally goes down like a cup of cold sick whoever does it and in whatever category they're doing it particularly so, when you think that uh sorry uh, that netflix used to be a one-stop shop you could go there for everything they were the virtual blockbuster certainly when they yeah. were disc service stateside and then first as they were a streaming service and they you know announced with some pride that we have everything and it's not that way anymore no and, and what infuri- infuriates me is i'm not le- the thing with netflix i was never looking for big ticket items i enjoyed it when they had every season of the a-team on there yeah um and i can't ne- i mean i don't know necessarily if that fa- found a home on some other streaming service that i've missed certainly not in europe so it it's infuriating essentially i don't think i don't begrudge them for doing something which a number of other online demand entities have done for some years. I mean, you know, all the way back to the beginning, if you have one Spotify account and you try and make it work for multiple people, it right from, from 2007, it's told you to poke off. So, you know, this is not, I mean, yes, okay, they've blown hot and cold on the mechanics of doing so, but what they're doing is not explicitly unusual. They're just in a perilous position where they're also antagonizing people for other reasons at the same time. And historically, that doesn't go down well. As Jules points out, we all have other things to be spending money on. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, right, so um, I noticed there was one other bit of news, but we're going to gloss over that because it's Sony announcing a soundbar, an S2000, HTS2000 soundbar, 3.1 channels. It'll be very good. It'll be solid. Um, it'll give you a decent sound, and they'll charge a fortune for it. Um, so there you go. That's that covered nice and succinctly. Uh, let's move on to... Something I think I'm the only one on the planet who hasn't actually watched the videos on this today and and uh, read the news. That was Apple who unveiled the uh, Vision Pro mixed reality headset. Ian, what the hell is it? Uh, yeah, if you've got three and a half thousand dollars to spare, happy to be living in the US early next year, you could be uh, among the first to get your hands on Apple's much anticipated move into the mixed slash virtual slash augmented reality market. Um, basically, you know, look like a pair of skiing goggles stuck on your face. Um, that can do uh, all of the things that, you know, your standard iPhone, iPads and so on can do. Um, but with the added bonus of um, the augmented reality features uh, that, that come with it. Um, it works as if uh, you're looking through a camera on your phone. So you're not actually seeing through the goggles, you're seeing a live stream video. Uh, and obviously that makes it easy then to overlay whatever and whatever websites you want to pop up whatever apps you want to pop up absolutely anything you can think of that you could put on a screen you should be able to display with the the vision pro and it's that kind of interactivity which is basically the big selling point of it and the fact that you can have multiple screens you know it's not exactly minority report stuff but it, it's it's getting sort of in that direction um comes with uh obviously the two displays of your eyes uh 23 million pixels between them which puts them well in excess of 4k quality so if you did want to use it to watch, literally, you can watch TV screens of any size you like. It should be decent enough quality. Um, also comes with 3D capture uh, and playback, which could be a bit of a selling point, given that 3D isn't obviously doing great things in the commercial sector. But it could encourage uh, a few more 3D opportunities to come through, even if you're just filming your own stuff. You know, it's going to give you that added level of immersion. Um, and, you know, there's obviously going to be a whole bunch of other fun features that come with it. The good news is that it's it's 
uh, open to third party developers. So I think there'll be a lot more sort of creative opportunities coming from the community. But obviously, if you're going to be spending three and a half thousand dollars on something, you really want it to have something unique, something truly special and, and ultimately practical if it's to be anything more than a rich person's plaything. And that's kind of where VR has stumbled a bit in the past. So it will be very interesting to see what it can give us. I, this... I'd like to have a go, but I would like to have to buy one. Well, this is an interesting one. I mean, uh, the two, there were two things I noted on Twitter. One fairly relevant, one rather more niche, and I think it bears repeating. The first is if you – they're making the valid point that this is – that the price, this – I mean, it's the same as judging Apple for generation one of various other iterations of things they've done. They've been intriguing. They've got people talking, um, but they've essentially paved the way to the point where you notice four generations in that everyone's got one and they will actually have a use for it. I mean, let's face it, the iPad created a use model for itself. It arrived, people going, why do I want a giant phone that isn't a phone? And it sort of, you know, it carved out its its thing from there. Uh, so that was the sort of relevant thing. You need to, um, we, we ought to see what happens if they stick with it and they keep doing things to it. Someone else rather more cynically suggested that its success could hinge on whether Apple allows it to become the greatest pornography delivery system that humanity <laughs> has ever seen. Um, and it's not for me to comment on um, the mechanics of that, but let's be honest. I mean, we think back to beta and v VHS. There say, is, you, you um, um, there is some mileage in, in, in how we consume our grumble. Yeah. Um, so yeah, who knows if they open the floodgates in all of the horrible connotations that there may be for that. Um, yeah, I mean, that could possibly be something of a shape, a shaping experience as well. So we'll see, you know, and also I think it's worth mentioning that this is the pro version, which opens up the gates for them to do, uh, more versions yes. that are more affordable. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, I mean, don't forget also that with a number of Apple things, the first iteration of it, certain bits of it. You know, the concept survives, other bits of it simply disappear by the wayside. Yeah. I mean, don't forget, I mean, remember when the Apple Watch first gen demos got, I mean, the, most versions of Apple Watch have continued, to, but do you remember the very first ones had those ultra premium finishes ones? They cost several thousand pounds. They were in gold and all sorts of stuff. And that literally, that died on its ass. So they're not averse to going, well, that worked, that didn't, and being utterly ruthless about it. So we'll see what happens um, after that. Okay, um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to be the cynical one, but um, I somehow don't think it's going to be as good as the uh, as as the presentation and the hype and everything else. And I haven't seen the presentation hype, right? but if it's an Apple product, I know exactly what they said and how it was delivered and so on. So it'll be interesting to you know actually see how it how it works in the real world. Right, uh, home cinema wise, we're going to wrap up. It's actually a home cinema slash hi-fi product, but we'll, we'll leave it in this section. Clips, the seven powered speakers, what are they? Uh, and, and you know, Martin, why should we be interested? Well, it, it's worth mentioning, actually, that Clips really is an institution stateside. You know, if anybody mentions that they want to build a home cinema, there's a chorus of buy Clips. I mean, they really are a uh, Tennessee-based company, extremely well-known. Um, the seven sit between the um, imaginatively named the fives and the nines. They're big, tall speakers at 42 centimeters. Uh, they weigh a uh, hefty 10 kilograms each. So that's much bigger than what we might have thought of, think of as bookshelf speakers. Um, they look something like uh, a, a set of speakers from the 60s or 70s or the vinyl heyday. And if you like those mid century looks, these will definitely complement those environments. Eclipse obviously sees these as a replacement for not only a soundbar, but perhaps your main hi-fi as well, because they're powered. One of the speakers has the nerve center, as they call it. Uh, there's HDMI arc on the back as well as an integrated phono preamp. But there's no Wi-Fi or Ethernet connection, which some might miss. But the app is very useful. And the remote response, however, was a little slow and tardy. Actually, you can press for action and uh, it it uh, takes a while to to uh, to make the change. Um, but they're beautiful solid speakers with a nice wood veneer, although MDF construction, the front is characterized by the large Tractix horn and embedded tweeter, and of course the 6.5 inch woofer plus reflex port. Um, 80 watts go to each of the woofers and 20 watts to each of the tweeters respectively. 
while you get all the requisite punch and good dynamics on movies, there's also delightful detail on music too. What surprised me though overall is how warm and smooth the musical response is. I expected something harder and less forgiving from horn loaded speakers. Yeah, especially American made. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's kind of the preconception you have going in, isn't it? Yeah, most definitely. Um, I couldn't get much of a sense of soundstage uh, depth, but I did think the left right imaging was uh, very convincing. Uh, just a great pleasure um playing with these speakers for the couple of days that i did and how much are they they are uh 1449 okay and ed you've been looking at which one was it is it nines you've looked oh, at? i've got the nines yeah, yeah. I, I looked at I, I didn't realize martin was doing the sevens and I, I thankfully i was given the option of doing both i thought well if i'm going to do this i might as well get the biggest ones um <laughs> uh, uh most of the comments i echo from martin the only thing i uh, i don't know if Mar martin did you notice this they ship with this system called dynamic base EQ yes, on, yes. and it's absolute chud. And the first thing you must do upon taking delivery of your speakers is to turn it off, because uh, you will otherwise go uh, assume that Martin and I are drunk. Um, yeah, because uh, it's very interesting you mentioned that. I did mention that in the review, actually. I thought it was actually masking some of the mid frequencies. Mm. It, it felt like it was laid on with a trowel, and I kept it off. No, no, I mean, the, the nines, Clips says they go down to 22 hertz with it on, and they might do, but they sound, I mean, <laughs> think Notting Hill Carnival system uh, yeah. with a tea towel wrapped around your head, sort of <laughs> as an effect. It's absolutely un unusable. Uh, but no, uh, as I say, the nines review is in the tank. It will appear at a time of, of the AV Forum staff's choosing. I echo Martin's sentiment. It, I do think the more expensive they get, so by the time you get to the nines, that's 1,800 quid. The fact that they don't have wireless, it's all very well for me. I mean, I've got various things with USB outputs and wireless headed streamers and all sorts of things. I can bolt stuff from the cupboard in a way they go. If you're a sane, sensible, normal human being, I don't necessarily know if how how appealing that's going to be because things with a genuine, you know, UPnP and wireless head and no additional wiring are available for very similar prices. I will say that the nines used as an, a TV add-on though are a joy. I mean, it's just, it's completely different to immersive audio, but it's this giant wide baffle sound that yeah. I was going on about when I reviewed those fine classics. It's just a big effortless friendly sound. I can see why people, um, will be inured with these and um the other thing i would say is that martin got the pick of the finishes because i've got nines in black and you'd have to be determined to want to own them in the black it's a pretty austere looking thing whereas the wood finish as you say it's quite it's quite retro it's quite charming so yeah that we won't put, cover the nines in a future podcast because that means we have done the complete range but my nines review will be going up sometime in in june i imagine and you can compare notes and see see which one of them might work better for you i have a hunch that fun as the nine is the seven is probably all the wireless speaker that most sane people will ever actually need and, and i think yeah. you also reviewed the fives i've uh, done the fives yeah. yes um, and interestingly, the fives in black come in a sheen finish, which looks really nice, but they've moved back to black ash for the nines. And it's just, well, it's it's not 60s, it's 80s. And, you know, whilst I'm very fond of the 1980s, most people are not. So, <laughs> you know, I would say that that's, that's something to choose with some care. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, that's it for the home cinema section. We're going to come back for Ed's hi-fi section next. If you enjoy the podcast on YouTube, then please like and subscribe. If you're listening to the audio version, then please leave us a rating on your podcast app. We invite you to email questions and feedback to podcast at avforums.com and join in with this episode's discussion thread in the podcasts forum at avforums. Right then, hi-fi section. Uh, Phil's gone off uh, to uh, have a moment to himself. Uh, maybe using an Apple headset, who knows? Uh, right. Um, we've got uh, one news story uh, from a little bit earlier in, uh, well, actually la late last month, um, which is uh, IFI Audio, who most of us know for making very affordable things. But Ian, they've made something which by their standards is positively not affordable. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was something we touched on in the last podcast because they did the rather awkward thing of actually having it at the high end show in Munich. Uh, a couple of days before the podcast, but then not actually officially unveiling it until uh, about a week later. Yeah. Um, so just to clarify a few of the points, yes, the uh, ICANN Phantom uh, is this new flagship headphone amplifier. 
I think we had a punt at the price last time, but it's now been confirmed to be at £3,749, which is quite a step up mm. from uh, its varying predecessors. Um, but the company promises that it can deliver, and I am quoting here, uh, a reference quality sound with everything from hypersensitive in-ear monitors to the most power-hungry electrostatic headphone. Um, obviously, you've got all the, more of the tech details and what's inside uh, the, the amplifier up on the, the website. Um, one of the more interesting additions, perhaps, could be uh, iFi's new Nexus module that offers a network connected control system with lots of settings and data that you get to toy with at your leisure. Um, and it is due to start shipping later in this month, we, we now know. So um, could it be a better way of spending three grand and buying a Vision Pro? Well, who knows? Um, I mean, I will say the spec is astonishing. Uh, if you are one of those people where you've looked at different people doing different things with headphone amplifiers. So, I mean, in, in, in you know, we've looked at one or two things here. We've looked at the name, uh, which is a sort of solid state, very clever streaming front end. We've looked at the Macintosh headphone amplifier, which is extremely bare bones and valve based. IFI essentially going, yeah, have all of it. You can uh, essentially make it run in a method which is analogous to either of those two, and you can switch between them on the fly and at leisure. It is a stupendously clever piece of kit, and if it's engineered like the more affordable things, it's likely to be astonishingly good. I will say, and I possibly may get scratched off the IFI Christmas card list for this, um, this does seem to be a company where um, the less their products cost, the better they look. Um, the really affordable IFI things are genuinely attractive pieces of industrial design. I really, really like them. I don't doubt that this looks better in the flesh than it does in the photos. I don't feel that this is an especially attractive device, and it does appear that a number of other forum readers have a, a similar a similar view to me on this one. But um, this isn't an, an immediate priority to look at for ABF. It's quite a specialist object. If you are interested in me looking at it, do let me know and we can see if we can pencil it in towards the back half of the year. Right. Thank you for that, Ian. Um, I have been looking at the Focal Favor 2 floor stander. Uh, this comes literally back to back with the Vestia 1 stand mount that I looked at relatively recently. The Thaver 2, I had the option of the stand mount, but as people say, Ed, you always review stand mounts, do some floor standards. So I've done some floor standards because they're small and they didn't herniate me. Um, and I'm very glad I did because this is a genuinely outstanding now speaker. It's, if I say that the Vestia is excellent because it embodies all the things that Focal does very well and it's extremely capable and it's in a very accurate, um, the favor does all of those things, but it also manages to be an absolute riot at the same time. It's enormously fun to listen to. Um, it uh, also uh, does something which I think uh, more, I wish more speaker manufacturers would do. Focal claims a low end roll off of uh, 53 hertz, which is um, possibly one of the finest examples of understatement I've ever seen in my life. It Obviously, it will go 53 hertz. Uh, in the room I listen to them in i i do some i run some basic measurements with the microphone and see where we go i didn't get any roll off until i didn't dip below the plus minus 3 db threshold until 38 hertz and it was still producing meaningful output 30 hertz which for a relatively slim floor stander is genuinely impressive and it's not clipped dynamic bass like martin and i were just talking about it it's it's quick it's controlled it happens you know neatly it, it just cements the fact that you can listen to big energetic pieces of music on this speaker and it's an uh, it's an, a joy um it's an unusual piece of kit in so far as it deliberately exists or, you know focal will happily sell you sen a sense speaker and surrounds to go with it but it's not designed for that it uses a size of driver which none of the other models in the range do it's largely designed to be a stereo speaker and the reward for that is it is a genuinely excellent stereo speaker the only caveat this is covered in the review in greater length is it's not a quick fix to improve a very affordable system. They're sensitive, but they do rely on you having a reasonable amount of current to drive them. So I ran some experiments with a 600 pound amplifier, very good 600 pound amplifier, but not an especially powerful 600 pound amplifier. And whilst the result was very listenable, it was nowhere near as good as it was on something with a bit more welly behind it. So do make sure that you've got a bit of power. Um, ideally, try and listen to them. I mean, they're in a multiple dealers across the UK I, I wouldn't have thought it was that difficult to find somewhere not a million miles away from you where you could actually get ears on and commit to knowing what you're going to buy before you drop £1,300 on them. But, I mean, maybe that's just me being old-fashioned. I don't know. All reviews on the site. If you have any questions, um, please just ask them in the comments section on either the speaker or the podcast. 
Yeah, it's also I've worth. Got a, I've got. A, I've got a question. Yeah, all right. At, at the price point, what's the main rivals here in terms of floor stand? Um, I haven't tested that. I, this is confession time. I haven't tested that many uh, floor standers. Acoustic Energy um, produce the the big three hundred, which is going to be uh, a, a a bigger and more convincing sounding thing, um, but probably not as totally accurate. I don't think it's going to be quite a sort of together and cohesive um q acoustics will have a floor stander for the uh upcoming 5000 model uh which we will have a look at because it's an important speaker i suspect that that's going to put up a very very good fight um and then obviously if you don't need a speaker this size stand mounts there's some cracking options i mean fine make the f500 sp s500 sp that's still one of my very favourite speakers you can buy at this price, Phil. If you don't need to fill a giant room, I still maintain that stand mounts make more sense in more UK lounges than floor standers do. So have a listen. I mean, I will say, if you do want a floor stander, this is a, an extremely well-behaved one. It, it, it dialed in perfectly happily in this room. So, you know, it's not a night and day difference, but most stand mounts don't put up any fight at all in my lounge and they still produce as far as what i'm concerned is a room filling sound and um, uh, a multi-room ed uh multi-channel or multi-room uh, sorry multi-channel um again q acoustics is going to be a major a major player klipsch makes some uh very decent options and you are getting into the price point where Kef starts doing some some seriously good work as well. And we all know that Kef's upward firing stuff is is genuinely excellent. So and excuse my ignorance here, but Focal, it's not a brand that I am that familiar with. Um, yeah. Obviously, I, I don't review that type of product, but do they have a, a, a multi-channel system based around the Thesa number yes, two? Yes, they do. And not only that, uh, the larger floor standard, the Thaver 3, um, you can buy it as a standard pair with nothing poking out the top of them, or you can buy them with upward firing drivers built into okay. the top section. So it's not a question of having to then add bolt-ons. Yeah. It comes with upward firing built in. And uh, we looked at the Cora series, which was the first Focal speaker to do that, and the consensus was that it was really very, very good indeed. But you were obviously paying to have it installed. And if you then wanted to make a move to actually you know, go in the whole hog and putting speakers in the ceiling, it, there was nothing to sell off to do that. You'd have those in built into the top of the speakers, whether you liked it or not. But it's an incredibly tidy solution. It makes the sit on upward firing speakers look a bit inelegant by comparison. It's very, very neat and very, very tidy. So yes, and there's a dedicated surround as well. In, which is a rare beast okay. in this day and age. There's an yeah, on-wall is... surround. Um, I actually, I, 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 I skyped. Uh, as I say, the, there are samples available for multi-channel. So if we can yes. motivate the multi-channel boys to have mm -hmm. a look, we can probably get that squared away. And I think that could make for an, an interesting experience. Yeah, we uh, will definitely be doing that at some point. Excellent. So yes, that's as I say, reviews up on site if you've got any questions. Uh, there's loads more things coming. I'm not going to go into length about it now because we are fast running out of time. But um, there's the, I, I, I put some things up on the site and uh, more things are on their way. So yeah, lots of different stuff. Uh, right, finally, let's finish with um, album, vinyl and, and playlist. Um, album of the podcast is the Cowboy Junkies, who have been around for donkey's years. They released an album where I've embarrassingly forgotten the name um, called Such Ferocious Beauty. It's their first in a little while, actually. Um, if you don't like the Cowboy Junkies, this ain't going to do anything to change it. They have sounded extraordinarily similar and, and consistent for nearly 40 years. So don't expect miracles, but it's a gorgeous listen. Um, a, a tr beautifully recorded, emotive. Um, it, it's one of those things where you, it sort of starts happening to you in the background. And before you know it, you're not concentrating on anything else. You're enjoying the album. I think it's one of their better works this century. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, it's available on all the major streaming services. You can buy it on vinyl if you feel like it. Um, you can buy it on CD if the fancy takes you. Um, and uh, yes, I, I would wholeheartedly recommend that you give that some of your time. Vinyl, uh, the reason this is the vinyl release of the podcast is because it is only available as a download or on vinyl. It is the only physical format that you can buy it in. It's a band rather unprepossessingly called Sweat. Um, and the album is called Who Do They Think They Are? Now this released uh, the last Friday in May, 
Uh, but it could have just as easily released in Friday, May in 1975. It sounds absolutely of that, and you wouldn't have batted an eyelid if it came out in 1975, but it is an absolute riot to listen to. Um, I was hoping to hold my record up in front of the uh, front of the thing, but it's been delayed by one day, so it's probably going to turn up tomorrow, annoyingly. Um, it's on all the streaming services as well. For the love of all things, don't listen to any of the other albums that the band have done, because they're all absolutely appalling <laughs> um i don't know what they've done to do this but oh let's listen to the back oh no let's not listen to the back catalog at all it's really not very good at all um but no this is it's 30 minutes and it's a joy i mean last year i i waxed lyrical about an album, about an album by a band called the sheepdogs and a number of people got very excited about that it was quite a, quite a nice moment of feedback this is more in the vein of that it it's it's just glorious straight out of the 70s stuff now playlist um i having made you all listen to uh turkish music last time around i thought i'd play it a bit safer this time it was Tidal. a delight well i i i loved it um i noticed however there was not a lot of other feedback from people <laughs> So this time, Tidal has released Weekend Waves, um, and it's just chock full of bangers, basically. I mean, by the time this comes out on Monday, you'll be some distance on the weekend. But if you listen to this, the weekend will just seem a bit closer. As with all curated playlists on streaming services, I don't believe that you'll like every single song that's on there. But I'll r wager that, especially if you're of a sort of uh, energetic electronic frame of mind, you'll like more than you dislike. So get stuck into that and and, you know, Hopefully, that's a bit more mainstream than some of the chud that I've been coming out recently. Ed, thank you very much uh, for your hi fi section. As always, and your recommendations, uh, we'll get through some of them uh, when I've got time. I'll, uh, I'll have some of them on as background music and, and give them a go. Uh, but that's it for uh, the podcast this week. The next AV Forums podcast is a movies edition. Uh, that's on Monday, the 19th of June. That will be live at 8.30. Well, we come back on the main podcast. Uh, we return in two weeks' time on the 26th of June. And again, we start at the usual time live on YouTube at 7 p.m. And of course, you can listen to the podcast at any time after they've been live streamed. They're then available audio only or on YouTube. So you can watch them at any point. And uh, again, if you've got any comments, questions and so on, uh, then go to AV Forums, got the podcast forum and put your questions or your comments or your feedback in the thread uh, associated to the podcast that you're listening to. Uh, right, so my thanks to Ed, Ian, Jules and Martin. Uh, thank you very much, guys. No worries. And of course, uh, our special guests this week were Stacey Spears and Don Mansell of Spears and Mansell fame. Uh, it was great having them on. Uh, if you enjoyed that content, if you've got any questions for the guys, again, we can pass them on and get the answers. So uh, do that as well. Uh, if you've enjoyed the podcast, then you could give it a like. And if you want to listen to us on a weekly basis, then why not subscribe? to the channel. Uh, you can subscribe to this, the main YouTube channel, but we also have another YouTube channel uh, where we post uh, little snippets of the podcast. That's called AV Forums Podcast. Uh, so why not go over there and subscribe to that as well? And you can watch or listen in little bite-sized uh, sections as well. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter, feed, um, Facebook, Instagram, all the usual socials. Uh, we are on there. It's usually at AV Forums. Um, so yeah, go check us out on the socials. And of course, don't forget AV Forums. You can book back the site and we have all the latest reviews news and videos up on there and yeah if you listen to us on a podcast provider and they allow you to leave a rating then five stars please unless it's 10 and out of 10 and then give us a solid five That'll all the stars us. all the stars yeah i'm phil hinton thank you very much for watching and listening and we'll see you again very soon good night Cheers.